Okay, we'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to our Riverside chat with the Boise River Enhancement Network. And we have Tate Liebenau with us. He's with the University of Idaho and he is running the Crayfish Mercury Project this year, which we are going to be helping with in late August. So he is going to talk to us about that project. And Tate, I will let you take over. Thank you so much. I'm going to do this awkward transition to sharing my screen. Um, okay. Can everybody see this? Just want to make sure that it's sharing. Okay. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I appreciate you all taking the time to hear a little bit about um, what we did uh, with the Crayfish Mercury Project and you know what our, what our goals are for the 2022 season as well. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tate Liebenau. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Idaho and my advisor, Dr. Alan Kolak, who's on this call. Um, it's good the current PI working on this project, and uh, we're working out of the Idaho Water Resources Research Institute. Now, before I go into the 2021 synopsis on what we did, I kind of just want to, for those of you who aren't familiar with who we are, uh, uh, go into a little detail about who we are, uh, what we do, and what the importance of this project and the eyes of the community uh, can bring. Okay. So who we are, right, we're professional researchers here at IWERI. Um, Dr. Kolak is an ecotoxicologist, and what that is is a researcher who evaluates uh, concentrations and distributions of contaminants in the environment and makes in, uh, what those implications mean for the public health. But more importantly, instead of looking at us from a professional research standpoint, um, we're also community members. We are residents of Idaho. We are citizens of the Columbia, so we want to blur these lines. And so when I say uh, community or the greater community, I want you to all to think of us as a part of that as well. Because as researchers and community members, I feel that we have a, an obligation and a moral obligation to at least be aware of what's going on in our environment, as well as take an actionable stance in and really uh, taking control of what we say goes on in our local resources and educate ourselves about that kind of stuff. Um, so a little bit of what we do with the Crayfish Mercury Project, in a broad sense, we monitor contaminants in, in our local resources across the basin, uh, namely mercury. And the way we do that is by using crayfish as an environmental sentinel. And an environmental sentinel in a basic sense is a, an organism that's out in the field that can tell us a story about what's going on, um, either chemically, uh, ecologically, things of that nature. But we use it as much more than just a sentinel, but we actually use it as a stepping stone and a multi-tool. And what I mean by that is that the crayfish um, communities that want to work with us have been really receptive to working with crayfish, which has opened up an avenue for collaboration for people such as yourself with Bren, uh, the Spokane Riverkeeper, uh, numerous tribes like the Salish tribe, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, uh, students of all ages as well, especially people of all backgrounds. Uh, so we found it very uh, useful for us to use the crayfish as a, as a tool to engage with the community. We also use it in a way to educate uh, students with ecological health, public health. I've also brought in uh, other aspects like uh, stream health and stuff like that. And more importantly, we use the data that's acquired from the crayfish to inform um, the community about what's going on with their environment, as well as um, bring attention to advisories for consumption of mercury, uh, agencies and uh, other schools like that. So uh, here's a graphical sense of, of, of what I kind of just said. This is how we use crayfish um, in the ecotoxicological field. Essentially, we use the crayfish to tell a story about mercury and what's going on in the environment with, with mercury through the use of crayfish. 
And from that data that we acquire, we inform the community. We actually um, work with the community to acquire that data. And we also use it for research purposes. We use crayfish to push the field of environmental monitoring and ecotoxicology through understanding the mercury dynamics in animals, uh, namely crayfish, as well as understanding what biotic and abiotic factors are significantly impacting the bioaccumulation of mercury uh, within crayfish. And from that, we can make inferences to uh, human health, to trophic transfer, um, things of that nature. So there's, it's very multifaceted and it's, it has a lot of potential to answer a lot of questions. So the community, right? The community, the community, this is like the most important part of, of the crayfish mercury project because in environmental monitoring, the field is now shifting towards integrating um, putting the community or putting the tools of research and environmental monitoring into the hands of the community. And with this project, the participants and individuals can, can uh, go from the ground level of collection where they're familiarizing themselves with the, uh, the strategies or the techniques of actually going out and collecting the crayfish, collecting um, biotic and abiotic data like water temperatures using probes, things like that. Uh, we also gear a lot of more STEM aspects, more sciencey aspects and the engagement and identification portion for those who are interested, which we found very, uh, very beneficial for students. This past uh, two weeks actually went out with a bunch of students from the Columbia School District, as well as with the Salish School in Spokane. And I was teaching them a lot about the importance of eco, uh, eco ecological health and how crayfish can be indicators for that, the distribution of invasives and native species. I've even brought in concepts of soil science and a little bit of chemistry. And it's just really cool to be able to expose students to that kind of opportunity, especially within their prime academic years of like high school middle school. So they have the options of pursuing that when they get to college or as a career. And most importantly, right, building these relationships, the relationships between professional researchers and the community, between the community and their environment. We believe that the Crayfish Mercury Project really gets people in a more intimate relationship and aware with what's going on with their local resources, which is a very I think it's a, a beautiful thing for people to start taking that, that action and saying, okay, well, we know that there's mercury in these fish or in these crayfish. Is this safe for my family without relying on the, on the professionals to make that decision for you? So a method in which we collect our data is this thing called crowdsourcing, right? I'm just gonna really briefly talk about, you know, what the cyclic, pattern of crowdsourcing is relative to the Crayfish Mercury project. We truly wouldn't be able to do this project without the help of the community because of the, the geographic expanse of the basin, the sheer number of samples needed to collect, and just the, the lack of manpower without the involvement of people and the interest of people. So we start with developing the tools, right? In our sense, it was creating the website so the people have somewhere to go to learn a little bit more about the project, to sign waivers, to contact us, and to really, that's the first step of involvement. And the next step would be empowering the crowd where representatives of the project or myself or researchers come to the crowd, come to the community and provide them with the equipment effectively giving the community the capacity to perform this monitoring, to capture these samples. And this is an important step because this also mobilizes the community and gets them interested in things like environmental monitoring or environmental awareness. And the next step would be collecting the data where myself or a representative or even the community as an individual um, without um, us there can collect crayfish and collect this meaningful data and hopefully in an orthogonal fashion in which the tail end of the research, the statistics, the, 
the uh, assessments can do things like providing feedback to both the community agencies advisory committees in the form of infographics that we have on our website currently publications conferences uh, rotations at council meetings just a, a whole suite of things that we can do from the data that we've collected with the community. And then after we've provided feedback, we actually inquire the community to provide us feedback on what they thought was good, what worked, what didn't work, what they would like to see happen, what sites they would like to see sampled in the future. And from that, we redevelop those tools. And with this cyclical pattern, every year we're getting a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more efficient and always growing better in the right direction because of our response to community feedback. So with this crowdsource collection, we truly can collect all of the data, meaningful data that we need, while also getting better every year by listening to what the community wants to do next. So enough about the background and, and you know who we are, what we do. Um, time to get into like what we did in the 2021 that Brent actually substantially helped us with. And um, as you all may know, the Columbia River Basin is our study site. And as you can see, it's quite expansive. It's 258,000 square miles. And in the summer of 2021, oops, sorry about that. I must have off clicked something. Bear with me there. Oh, I apologize. Um, one second. Okay, sorry about that. Back to back to business. Um, in the summer of 2021, we collected uh, 315 individual crayfish species, um, and that was over the uh, the court uh, the geography of four different states: so Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. And within those 315, we found three species, the signal crayfish, the rusty crayfish, as well as the viral crayfish. And uh, from the community aspect of summer 2021, we, within those four states, we sampled over 15 different watersheds, which is um, huge geographic coverage. Again, couldn't have done it without the participation of the, of the general public. We had over nine organizations and over 100 volunteers in just year one alone. Um, so we really want to see that and more. And we know it's growing more just of how the start of the season has been this year alone. And um, we, again, want to see more people out there because we think it's a great opportunity for us and the public to connect more to our environment. So from a, from a very basic uh, graphic visual again this is on our website um, we have the 15 individual watersheds with their average mercury concentration and if you are interested this lower Boise that's green right here is the average mercury concentration that we found in the crayfish collected from uh, the lower Boise uh, river watershed and I know these colors uh, the color coding looks a little um, alarming with like the red and the uh, and the green and the orange. Uh, these are in no way uh, to be thought of as advisories against or for some are better than worse. Uh, it's just how I color coded each state. And uh, we found that when all these watersheds are pulled together that the mean mercury concentration of the Columbia River Basin is about 85 to 100 micrograms per kilogram. And you might be thinking like, what are these numbers? What is this parts per billion? What does this micrograms per kilogram mean? in terms of, is it safe, right? The general message, are these safe to eat? And we found that, yes, uh, when you compare these crayfish to the EPA Fish Consumption Advisory for Mercury, every single one of these crayfish are safe to eat. Um, none of them are falling within the avoidance level of greater than 460, but it is to be noted that there was one individual watershed and a few individual crayfish sampled from some watersheds that fell within a little bit more elevated than the, than the normal average, two being from Lower Boise, Flint Rock, Lower Clark Fork. Um, but again, I just want to stress the importance that 
none of these are a danger to eat straight out of the river. You can essentially go out and go crayfish and have a boil and be perfectly fine. And you're, so the worries would be set aside with that. So what we found um, relative to our research and what the what Bren actually helped tremendously with us in putting out our publication that's currently in review is we found that there are certain factors for the signal crayfish that significantly influence its accumulation of mercury within the environment. And that being um, the sex of the crayfish matters, where it's collected from the geography plays a very large part in the mercury accumulation of these crayfish, as well as the size. We found that the, the weight of the crayfish is positively correlated with its mercury content. So, what this is, what I'm trying to say is, is that we're trying to understand our sensor a little bit better so that we can more accurately predict mercury concentrations in the future. And we can assess and evaluate trends temporally or, or on a spatial scale. Um, so it was really cool to see. And again, we thank you for being able to collect such a great sample size uh, with us for this kind of question to be answered. You know, so I was kind of want to briefly go into the uh, the goals for 2022 um, relative to Bren from a community aspect. Um, what we think that would be a good synergy between us for when we go out this season. Uh, we definitely want to revisit the Lower Boise River watershed and conduct that round two of collection. We want to provide the opportunity for people that may have missed it last year to um, come in come and get that chance again this year to learn a little bit about their environment, a little bit more education, become uh, more connected to their local resources, and maybe provide some temporal data that, um, that, we, that we would like to use in the future. We also wanna bring that experiential science to the community. Um, it would be amazing for uh, students or aspiring uh, STEM majors to come out and learn that applicable hands-on learning that they can then transfer to maybe a passion of theirs that they that they want to pursue or any kind of opportunity in the future for that. And most importantly, right, we want to involve and educate the general public within this project. Cannot stress the importance enough of being environmentally aware about what's going on and taking that, that responsibility of saying, we, we, we're, we're safe to eat crayfish here, or we're not gonna wait for the quote unquote professionals or agency to tell us whether something is safe or not. And the importance of monitoring mercury and these freshwater sentinels and how they can really tell us a story about what's going on. So uh, briefly wanna go again into the research goals for the Crayfish Mercury Project. So this is our goals um, for the overall grand scheme of things that also includes Bren, but we wanna keep developing that predictive multi-species model for the other two remaining species we found within the Pacific Northwest. And that's the rusty crayfish that we know is in Oregon. <clears throat> that's what our last year's data set told us. Our partners uh, with Critfic have also confirmed that they are abundant, they are invasive, and they need to be researched more. And then the invasive species here and in Washington, um, the viral crayfish, uh, the, northern, the, the northern crayfish for the common name. Um, they're here, they're a lot smaller, but again, the invasives, they outcompete resources for the native signal crayfish. So we're doing a service by taking them out of the water but on the research perspective, we want to understand what's what are their drivers that are also allowing them to accumulate mercury either in a different fashion or the same pattern as we're seeing with the signals. And again, you know, we want to finish the development of these sampling kits. We talked about this a couple months ago um, with Dr. Tiedman and I think some other members of Bren. And we had promises of developing a sampling kit that would allow individuals and communities to go out and sample independently if they like, or have the option to have a more streamlined sampling event uh, without a representative there. And so we're in about the last 10% stages of developing these. And these should be on the table definitely by next year. I want to promise that. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself and say it'll be done this year, but um, this is one of our goals 
is to finish the sampling kit because we really think that we're going to be able to cover a wider geography, reach a larger audience, get to some remote areas, and do some do some really good sampling, even to the greater extent of the basin. And finally, uh, we want to launch that crave interactive uh, website for our crayfish mercury project. Um, we, for those of you who don't know, we do have a website, but we're looking to revamp it to have shareable downloadable data of mercury data points where you can hover over these data points and see what the average mercury concentration in that watershed is, the species that were found there, the methods and people who collected it, just a really good opportunity for students to become more involved and ask, start asking questions themselves for teachers to start using it as curriculum development or integrating it within lab work. Um, this is going to be a really big overhaul of the current website, but it's going to be a million times better and it's going to have some really cool features that even um, Bren would like to use as a reference, the River Mile would like to use as a reference for looking at mercury data, looking at crayfish data, the whole nine yards. So we're really excited about this website. So, you know, reiterating it, we want to see you out there with us this year. And we cannot stress the importance enough that we cannot sample to the extent ge geographically and just the sheer sample size without you. We really value our relationship with Bren and our relationship with the community. And so we really appreciate all the stuff that you've done thus far. And again, uh, we're looking to grow this as the years come and as uh, time goes on. So we love for you to participate. You can visit us at our, uh, at our website. You can check that out. You can also email myself or Dr. Koloff directly. If you wanna know a little bit more about the project, anything I just talked about, or if you just wanna get in touch and say, how's the mercury looking in, 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 our, in our watershed or in the Columbia River Basin so far, uh, we'd be happy to, um, we'd be happy to, to talk to you about all that. And with that, you know, that's all, that's all I got for today. I, again, I appreciate you all coming out and listening to what I have to say and letting us have a platform to kind of speak to you about our project. Thank you, Tate. Um, we do have a couple of questions in our chat. I can just read those to you. Yeah. Um, from Dr. Tiedemann, it says, please speculate on why there are outliers in the Boise River data that are on the high end of the scale of concentration of mercury. Yeah, so uh, the outliers, it could be. Um, so, and, and I don't wanna like make any, any uh, definitive, like this is why, because we found outliers in a lot of different watersheds. So it, it, it could be geographically related. Um, I wouldn't make the claim that, oh, there just must be more mercury in this area because it also, the, the mercury concentration is also dependent on a couple other factors, right? Like, are they eating more things that are more rich in mercury? Are they, and then these are questions we haven't answered yet. Are they, are they depurating mercury faster? Are the smaller ones, um, eating a, or living in a certain area along the stream, a certain habitat type that's doing this? Is it because it's a, a, a larger female or a smaller male? Um, these are questions, or is there like a higher lipid content, correct? Um, these are questions that we haven't been able to answer yet, but these are actually within our, our scope of questions that we want to answer um, throughout the years of this crayfish mercury project. So I don't want to get, again, don't want to give any definitive answers, but these are questions that we have been brought up to in the past with a couple other presentations. And, you know, it's something that we're, we're going to be looking into. You know, what exactly are these other factors that are influencing these either spikes or non-spikes within these crayfish of mercury concentration. And then we have one from Jenna asking if male crayfish generally, or are male crayfish generally larger than females? I wonder if males have a greater accumulation of mercury 
um, is more tied to their size than their sex directly? Yeah, so it's a good question. We found that on average, within our sample size of the signal crayfish of 2021, we found that on average, uh, females actually contained elevated concentrations of mercury rather than males. We also found that female crayfish are generally, or um, not significantly, but they are on average larger than male crayfish. So when you, when you ask that question of, is the accumulation of mercury more tied to their, uh, their size than their sex? We know that they both matter because within the model that we developed, we found that they both significantly impact the accumulation of mercury. So when it comes to looking at what factors are contributing to its accumulation, we want to get as many as we can without that compromising the functionality of the model. But just, I mean, that's a conversation for a different topic, but we, we found that females on average contained elevated levels of mercury than males. We also found that female crayfish on average were a little bit larger than male crayfish as well. So it could be tied to that, but with that logic, both size and sex matter because not one or the other doesn't matter. Okay, and then Louisa, um, she says that when she lived in Oregon, one concern was that teachers were releasing what turned out to be invasive crayfish after the school year, these crayfish used in classroom studies and ordered online from science providers. Um, are you finding invasive species at all? Yeah, so that's an interesting because I, when I, so the, the, the guy I work with at CritFic also expressed concerns that, um, you know, the only invasive crayfish, there's actually a couple, there's the ringed crayfish, and then there's uh, the, the rusticus crayfish that are both invasive within the watershed uh, that we're sampling in Oregon with. Um, the virals are also down there, but within the John Day watershed in Oregon, that's where um, we're, we're really concerned with because it's the Columbia River Basin as well. Um, we, when I was trying to get a permit to scientifically collect in Oregon, um, the people at the Department of Fish and Wildlife said that you can catch crayfish all day long because there's an abundance of invasives, I think because of um, what uh, Louisa was uh, kind of elaborating on how they release these after the school year, but you can't transport them out of that watershed or out of that water, you have to basically take a legal take for them. So I don't know if the, long story short, I don't know if the Rusties that we're interested in are the ones that they were releasing after the school year. I do know that Oregon is the only place where the Rusties are uh, found within the Columbia River Basin as of right now. And that could be, that, that, that could be it. I also know that ringed are also um, invasive, but the Rusties could be that crayfish that you're referring to which is, which is a, a species that we're interested in building that model for. Okay, and then Jenna has another question. Um, are you concerned about bioaccumulation of mercury in any specific predators of crayfish other than humans? Uh, in any specific predators? Oh, so, okay, so uh, are we interested in, yeah, so we're actually, I mean, we're interested in really anything that eats crayfish. So the we study crayfish because they are, uh, they're 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 at a place in the trophic level where ecologically, predatory fish, foraging fish. On this picture you see right here, this is a mink eating. It's a terrestrial, a semi-aquatic mammal. We're interested in all of these for the purpose of the crayfish mercury project. Um, we really are bound by looking at just crayfish. But we can also make assumptions or implications that the crayf or the mercury concentration found in these crayfish have a direct impact on like avian species like bald eagles or osprey or predatory fish, smallmouth, largemouth bass, uh, perch, pike, things like that. We're interested in all that. Unfortunately, we can't um, do mercury analysis on them directly. But there are statistical methods in which we can address those questions like a biomagnification equation. And we can also use um, 
uh, relic data as well to see if there's some kind of uh, correlation there. It's a little bit more ha or hairy when you're basing it off of model assumptions and not a direct analysis. But yeah, the reason we're studying crayfish is because essentially every every everyone eats them, right? Uh, not everyone, including animals, including other crayfish, um, humans. So yeah, our concerns go a lot deeper than just um, just human consumption, although that is uh, definitely a primary concern. Um, but the ecological health wise, yeah, everything eats crayfish. So essentially, what we're finding at, at this level, the secondary consumer level on the trophic ladder, uh, impacts everything above it and on the same and on the same level. I wish I had more data for that, but um, unfortunately. Um, limited for now with that. Okay, and one other question from Louisa. She says, last year, a common loon was trapped in a small pond along the Boise River with crayfish, a large part of its diet until Idaho Fish and Game captured and released the bird at Lake Lowell. Are you catching and testing crayfish in any of the ponds along the Boise River for mercury? Um, as of right now, the only place in in uh, southern Idaho that we that we went to uh, was uh, that was that was that was the only place the the Boise River and I think some surrounding tribs, if I'm not mistaken. Um, ben would probably be able to speak more to if if those are the sites we we went to or if those are included in what you're referring to. Um, we'd be more than happy to go to any sites where there are crayfish. Any unique sites is great to visit if we can capture crayfish because it's um, building the, the, the heat map, right, of mercury concentration. It's building these unique locations that could be hot spots or not hot spots of mercury, but we would just have to, to capture crayfish in there to tell. And uh, I'd be more than happy if there's crayfish in these ponds um, that are surrounding or along the Boise River. Uh, I'd be happy to to work with with Ben or or whoever um, at Bren wants to uh, kind of spearhead some specific locations. I know that we just got to a new location this year uh, by Lake Roosevelt. We sampled two different places: um, Trout Creek, which is downstream from Trout Lake. And we got samples from two different places and we haven't tested them for mercury yet. But, you know, if we do see a difference, it would be interesting to make that question of <clears throat> how is habitat type influencing these uh, different accumulation rates and crayfish seemingly next to each other. And I do know that ponds in particular, still water, have a a uh, higher chance of methylation of inorganic mercury. So, you know, in theory, you would think that there would be higher mercury, but that's just not a question that we can answer of the data that we've collected right now. But that would be definitely interesting to, to catch and test for um, this year even. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. If any of the uh, viewers um, have any, you can either type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, just a reminder that Bryn will be catching crayfish with Tate on Saturday, August 27th, and we'll have the locations and times and all the information up on our Facebook page very soon, and we'll also send it out in our newsletters. So if you're interested in doing that, um, it's a family-friendly event. Children are welcome to come. Um, you know, bring friends and we will have hopefully a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we'll have a great time and I'll bring all the equipment that we need and I'll bring some extra fun science in the field kind of stuff. So um, yeah, please come, come join. Okay, well, I don't see any others. So thank you, Tate, so much for your time and um, I'll be in contact and I'll see you in August. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, yes, please feel free to email myself or Dr. K and we look forward to coming out in August. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tate. Of course. Yep. Thank you.